I'm Nisreen. I'm a public health doctor, an academic, and I do research on how we can prevent childhood obesity. So one in three children um, in England enter secondary school with them being overweight or obese. And one in four um, with the same, you know, enter primary school with overweight or obesity. So that's just four years of age. And it's not just children, mothers as well. About um, half of the women in England aged 16 to 44 years are overweight or obese. So I was one of them. Uh, I'm a mother of three children, and uh, after the birth of my first child, I gained 10 kilograms in weight, so one and a half stone, compared to my weight before pregnancy started. So I work in this area of research that looks at how health of the mother during pregnancy, including her weight, what she's exposed to, her environment, her behavior, how that shapes the health and disease risk for her children, things like childhood obesity and heart disease later in life. And actually, recent research in this area tells us that pregnancy is almost too late. It's the time before pregnancy for the parents, it's their health and their behavior before, so what they eat, what they drink, whether they smoke um, or not, um, they're exposed to pollution, if they're stressed, and their general uh, physical and mental health. That shapes the health of the children later in life. So that time before pregnancy, we call it the preconception period. And the time between two pregnancies is the preconception period for the next child. Um, and a lot of change happens in that time. Now, that certainly was the case for me. The birth of my first boy, Ali, who's just turned 16, was the most life-changing event for me. And, you know, everything changed in my life, including factors affecting my health. So I said, I mentioned my weight, obviously my sleep, uh, but also my diet changed. I really um, started eating more fast food, high calorie diet, really didn't have time you know, to worry about the quality of my diet. I was focusing on Ali's food um, and how to give kind of the best feeding for him. Also, I used to enjoy doing long walks before um, Ali was born, but he was born in the winter, so that went down the drain as well. Uh, so my exercise levels went down. Um, other aspects of my life change as well. So my job, so I changed from full-time to part-time, uh, but also even my specialty. I changed from clinical medicine to public health, and one of the reasons was that the new specialty offered more carer-friendly working patterns. Um, my, I was, um, I had, at the time, I had recently immigrated, so I didn't have family to support me. Um, I had some friends, and actually I made some new friends. My social contacts change. I made friends with people with small children, so I can do some child-friendly activities with them. I didn't really focus much on my health or stress levels, and all the care that I received from the system, from the health professionals, was mainly focused on Ali and how I, as a mother, was giving him the best start in life and being the best mother for him. Um, I, I, and that was my thinking too. I didn't really think that looking after myself well was part of that. So, um, forward time, three years later, I'm pregnant again and I gave birth to my then second son. I started my second pregnancy with some of my um, aspects of my health better, so my anxiety levels were better because I knew what to expect um, in pregnancy and childbirth. But other aspects were worse, such as my diet and exercise um, and my weight. And the time between pregnancies is what my current research focuses on. And this is new because normally what researchers and healthcare professionals focus on is treating each pregnancy a child as a, and child as a separate event. And what my team and I do, we look at the mother as a whole because pregnancies, successive pregnancies happen in the same mother. So me as a mother, my health and behavior and my environment before, during, and, um, and in between pregnancies. We actually know that the time between pregnancies is relatively short for most women. So in our research, about half of the women had um, you know, a period of between pregnancies of less than two years. We also know that most women will experience that period. Um, about three in five women um, in the UK will have at least two children in their lifetime. 
So we have an advantage during that period because it's a period of a relatively intensive contact with the healthcare system, GPs, midwives, health visitors, early years care, but not much focus um, on the health of mum or dad during that period. It's really around uh, about the child. So we can optimize the good things and counter out the bad things in that period, and we can change the system to do just that. Now, in the research uh, that my team and I did, we looked at the healthcare records of about 15,000 women who gave birth in Hampshire, in the south of England, and about half of them gained um, weight, like I did, and in fact, one in five gained more than the 10 kilograms that I, weigh, uh, that I gained between pregnancy. We found that women gaining weight between pregnancies um, were more likely to give birth to babies which were heavier than expected, and that's linked to having forceps delivery and cesarean section, and also the children being overweight or obese later in life. We actually found a direct link between um, gaining weight between, preg between pregnancies and, and the children being overweight or obese at the start of primary school. We also looked at other behaviors, so smoking. Not only smoking in pregnancy is linked to higher risk of childhood obesity, but actually smoking in between pregnancies and stopping every time pregnancy starts. So let me share with you a worry that I have about this area of research that I've been working in for about 10 years. I worry about how the media reports findings, um, research findings such as ours, usually sensational headlines you know, obese moms, so they're so bad, you know, they're causing this irreversible harm for their children. And, and I do worry when, you know, when the press approach us to report our research finding. I just don't want our research to be turned into another blaming and shaming mom story. Mothers, um, new mothers, you know, <coughs> face many challenges, like I did, and actually there are many mothers out there who face far bigger challenges than I ever did. Um, in our research, the mo mothers who gained weight between pregnancies were also likely to be unemployed, um, have left education at a younger age, and live in deprived neighborhoods. These mothers may be living with poverty. They may be struggling to make ends meet and secure the, best, um, the basic needs for their children. Uh, they may not be able to afford healthy food. Um, they may not be able to afford decent housing. They may be suffering from mental health problems or domestic abuse. They may not have help and support around. So blaming and shaming mothers does not benefit anyone. Recently, there was a news story, a headline news story, saying moms working full time are causing obesity for their children. Now, Things like that are almost never as black as, and white. I obviously went and looked at the original study, and in such studies and in research such, um, as I, the, what, the, what I do, it's really hard to establish for certain what causes what. You know, there are a lot of factors interacting with each other. But even if it's true, and even if we can establish beyond doubt that working full-time as a mom can increase the risk of the child becoming obese, what is the answer? Do we ask moms to stop working? So why should I stop working? I love my job. And also, I can't really afford to stop working. I'm supporting a household like so many other moms out there. And there are also positive effects from working, uh, from mom's employment on children's health. So there's other research reporting that. The solution is to get the system to address the mechanism underlying any you know, the negative link um, that are found in these studies. So there is really um, um, little research so far on how best we can support mums and families after the birth of their first, first child and between pregnancies in order to uh, maintain a healthy weight and improve their health and the health of their families. And in the next stage of our research, we're doing a project called The Wessex Friend and working with health visitors who interact with disadvantaged families. And we're trying out this 
you know, interactive website where um, the health visitors with the mothers and the fathers, they map out their social contacts, their friends, their family, and then the, all the resources around them um, and the places they can go to. So, for example, children's centers, uh, where they can get healthy food, play areas, you know, parks, uh, support groups. And we're hoping this social networking website um, can help maximize the resources around these families, particularly if they live in these, you know, in disadvantaged um, areas. Um, so, actually, such a resource would have been really useful for me after the birth of Ali. So, next time, uh, when you see these accusatory headlines in the news, or you get into one of these harsh and blaming conversations about mothers, perhaps you can be the one to say that we know that the vast majority of mums are doing their very best for their children. And it's time we as a society supported them, supported their efforts to improve the health of their families. Because better supported mums have better health, can give the best start in life for their children, and can help us prevent the rise of health problems such as childhood obesity. So fix the system, not the woman. Thank you.